and fight push push notifications for Linux. Volker will take away this presentation, and we hope you enjoy that. Thank you. Uh, right, so I want to talk a bit about uh, push notifications. Um, I basically have two parts for this. Uh, one of is a bit of a general overview. Um, what is this? Why do we need this? How do we get this? Uh, and then the second part goes into a bit, um, uh, or a few very specific details um, on on the technical level uh, with open questions uh, around cross-desktop interoperability, um, which I guess that is the, the right forum to ask these questions. Um, right, so let's get started. Um, what are push notifications? Uh, push notifications are a mechanism um, to support applications um, that occasionally need to receive some kind of information from their, uh, from their server side. Uh, and where the timely and reliable reception of that information is um, is important. Um, also, when the application isn't running. Um, common examples for this uh, are uh, any kind of communication application, um, chat calls, etc. Um, but also things like um, weather or public emergency alert messages. Um, and in order for this to work, even if the application isn't running, right, we have a bit of platform infrastructure um, that keeps um, a network connection open, receives the information, and then locally dispatches that to the, the right application and starts it if, uh, if necessary. Um, while this is very crucial for some kinds of applications, um, the ability to start something locally on your device from the server that you explicitly might have turned off, of course, also has um, some potential for abuse. Um, and that is especially a problem on the, the proprietary platforms. Um, and that's also where, where push notifications were first introduced, um, the proprietary uh, mobile operating systems, um, where especially in the, in the early days that was a um, basically an efficiency requirement. There wasn't simply enough resources to run all applications continuously and have them network connections open, right? So this needed to move into um, the platform. The systems that exist there, however, are, uh, well, proprietary. They only exist on those specific platforms. You can't exchange them with, with your own infrastructure. Um, and likewise, they are only available on those proprietary platforms. Right, so on our platforms, um, none of this is usable, um, not that we would want to use it. Um, so as usual, we have to build this ourselves. Um, there have been several attempts over the years to, to do this. Um, and this has resulted in um, unified push. Um, that is uh, basically a specification or a standard that um, defines um, how the server-side part of an application talks to the server-side part of the infrastructure and how the client-side application part talks to the client-side part of the infrastructure. Um, uh, unified push is mainly driven on uh, two types of platforms. It's the um, uh, debus-based uh, systems, like the, the normal Linux, uh, I guess most of us uh, are here for. Um, and equally, or even more so, um, the uh, Google-free Android variants, uh, Lineage OS, etc. And yeah, the, the unified push specification, client side on Linux, um, that is basically a very simple DBus interface. Applications can register and unregister for, for push notifications. Um, and if such a message is received, they get activated and get a DBus signal with that message. 
uh, fairly straightforward. Um, and on the server side, it's a HTTP post with the message you actually want to send. Um, in a bit more detail, that is the the general architecture of, uh, of a unified push setup. Um, on the top half, we have the server-side part. On the bottom half, we have the client-side part. On the left side, we have the application part. And on the right side, we have the infrastructure part. Um, so on the client, um, we have the so-called push notification distributor. That is a permanently running process part of the platform that keeps um, a network connection open to the server side part of the uh, push service. And if a message is received, um, that activates then the, the application if it's not already running and sends the message. Um, the part that Unified Push specifies here are the, the pinkish, whatever, bluish errors. Um, so between the um, platform infrastructure um, and the application side. What it doesn't specify is the communication between the, the client and server side part of the push infrastructure. That is left to the implementation of a specific push service. Um, we'll get to that in a bit uh, later. Um, there isn't just a specification though, there is also a number of already implemented components. Um, that includes the, uh, the server-side part. Um, uh, two are particularly worth mentioning here. Um, Notify, that is an implementation that can run without uh, requiring user registration or user accounts. Um, we'll see uh, later why that is relevant. Um, and for people running their own infrastructure um, around Nextcloud, for example, there is Nextpush, which is an add-on to Nextcloud. Um, so that makes it very easy to, um, to self-host um, this kind of infrastructure. Um, then there is a number of, um, I would say, production-ready uh, Android client side parts um, for those uh, push providers. Um, on the Diva side, however, um, the things that exist are mainly on a, uh, I would say, proof of concept level. Um, they work, but they might require uh, manual changes in config files or some command line setup, right? So that, that is not in a state um, where we can ship it. Um, however, uh, Dbus-based client-side code, I guess that is something, uh, or it's probably the
test test. Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, where was I? Right. UI uh, on top of this. Um, so we added UI to to actually configure this, um, which can be as easy as putting in just the URL to the to the service, or go through the uh, more complex authentication flow that that might be required for for next push. Um, and we added. Uh, well actually, I can show this. I think yes. Um, so the status display and configuration is on the top. Um, the other interesting part is uh, at the bottom, um, showing the currently uh, the, uh, the applications currently s listening to push notifications, and the ability to manually uh, disable that per application. Um, and I think that is crucial for giving the user um, transparency and control over what's actually happening with this setup. Uh, remember. I mentioned right in the beginning uh, the potential of abuse in, in such a setup. Um, with transparency and control, we have a very effective measure um, to, to counter this. And uh, I don't think any of the proprietary systems uh, give you that level of transparency and control. Um, right, so with everything put together, um, we actually have something working. Uh, so let's try the live demo. Um, if you send an HTTP uh, post to that URL, um, the content of that should show up as a message box on my screen, uh, on one of the screens at least. Um, while you try, um, one word to the, uh, about the, uh, the URL there, usually, you wouldn't get that kind of a vanity URL, but you would have some UUID there. The, oh, okay, okay, I see it's working. <laughs> Let me show this to you. Um, uh, yeah, and then of course people are trying to <laughs> see if my escaping works. Um, but let's put an end to this. Um, so I can now just, yeah, 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 stop this. And uh, uh, okay, so basically, right, we have something that works. Uh, usually, you just wouldn't have that guessable URL there. You would have a UUID um, that isn't guessable, um, that is just handcrafted, uh, so you don't have something complex to type and you actually get to see something. Okay, so far the, like the overview and introduction part, right? We basically have something that works. Um, what is left to do? Um, and now we need to go in some very specific details of the unified push specification. Um, one thing that is a bit surprising in there if you're used to working with dbus, um, unified push doesn't specify a unique service name for the distributor. Um, so you can, it basically it's just a prefix, right? And they can, multiple can coexist in theory. Um, and it's up to the application to decide which one to use. And that, of course, isn't really an ideal scenario. Um, especially when thinking about a, um, a more realistic hybrid cross-desktop scenario, right? So if there's a KDE distributor and a GNOME distributor and whatnot, right, then um, we have multiple of those things running needlessly. They all keep network connections active. Certainly not something uh, we would like to have. Um, there is reasons, though, why uh, Unified Push uh, specified it this way. Um, one is there are applications that can um, kind of implicitly provide 
push notification support. Uh, I think there's an Android XMPP uh, client that uses the existing XMPP infrastructure it uses to also provide push notification to other things on the system. Um, that might not be a relevant scenario on a, on a Linux system where we have much more control over the platform than on, an, on a Google free Android system, right? Because we are the platform. So um, we might not necessarily need to support that use case. Um, but right now, uh, Unified Push kind of supports that. Um, and the other problem is that distributors contain state. Um, they know which applications are subscribed and they need to uh, monitor for the, the corresponding messages. Um, so we can't have a scenario where there's two distributors racing for the same service name uh, because if the other one wins, right, then half the applications won't receive their push notifications. So we need, uh, we need some, some mechanism to, to agree which distributor to use. Um, there's certainly multiple options to do that, but it's something we need to, um, we need to sort out. Um, right, another part not covered by the specification uh, at all is the whole topic of how um, distributors are configured and how you can introspect what is currently going on. Um, that the configuration is kind of out of scope, that isn't really surprising given that the whole communication setup on the infrastructure part is also left to the implementation. Um, but if we want to have UI integrated in, in the platform, something KDE specific or something GNOME specific, right? That, that needs to work with whatever distributor is running on the system. Um, or at least it needs to be able to recognize that there is something else running on the system that it can't cover. Um, and that's especially important for the, the transparency and control part um, because we have to show either the complete picture there or none at all. We can't just show this is half of the applications using push notifications and we, ha we don't know about the other half, right? So. Um, that, uh, that also needs to be sorted out somehow. Um, there's, of course, multiple ways how we can approach this, right? We might find a way to enforce a single distributor. Um, we might want to standardize additional interfaces, uh, especially for that, that kind of introspection uh, workflow. Um, or some mechanism to agree which of the multiple distributors should be preferred. Um, we might also come to the conclusion that uh, let's just have a single implementation, right? Then that is de facto the standard, right? And we don't really need to bother with all the rest. Um, and there's probably many other ways to, to approach this as well. Um, and that's why I'm hoping to uh, get in touch with people here, um, especially people outside of the KDE community um, who are interested in that subject and to, um, yeah, to, to work together with, uh, with us and with uni the, the Unified Push team on resolving those remaining interoperability issues um, so we can actually start uh, deploying and shipping this. Um, without then causing a mess once, say, GNOME also starts to use this. Um, right, and then there is another uh, part we need to talk about, um, the, the server side of this. Um, we, of course, want to support um, self-hosted infrastructure in terms of transparency and control, right, that is the, the best possible scenario. But for the vast majority of our users, right, we, we can't expect them to have that. Um, 
If we, however, want to have applications that can rely on push notifications to be available everywhere, that means we need to provide um, a default server uh, in, in some form. And ideally one that just works out of the box, which means no sign up or registration required, right? No, no user account. Um, like on the proprietary platforms, once you have that, that Google device or so, um, push notifications just work. Um, that, however, then requires that we need to, uh, to host such infrastructure also on the server side. Um, and we, in this case, probably means GNOME, KDE, Linux distributors, right, those kind of um, communities. Um, on the, regarding the like resources and cost and so on, I'm told from people like Kenny that this is uh, well within the limits of similar infrastructure we already host, right? So this, this shouldn't be a problem cost-wise or um, hardware-wise. Um, but there are a few um, like non-technical challenges in, in this. Um, the first one is uh, the, the privacy implications of this. Um, as the push provider server, uh, or the push provider server will have uh, open network connections basically to every single active device, or at least every device that has applications on it using push notifications. So you will see their IP addresses, um, you will see how they move through, uh, through different networks and so on. Um, you will also see the messages they receive. Um, in theory, those messages should be encrypted, but that is something left to the application uh, because the infrastructure shouldn't know anything about the actual message payload. Um, so it, can't, it also can't enforce any kind of encryption. Um, and not everything currently out there is actually using encrypted uh, messages. Matrix, for example. I mean, they, they don't actually have the, the ch chat message in there. They basically just have a notification uh, or any, some kind of information in there to tell the application to check for new messages. But that still reveals some information, right? And those messages aren't just going through the server. Uh, they might also be stored there for, say, 24 hours or so. Um, when the, the device is currently offline. Um, and then we have the, the vandalism and abuse part of the problem. Um, first of all, there is no authentication, neither to the client side nor to the server side or application server side. Client side, we explicitly don't want this, right? Uh, as we said earlier, it needs to work out of the box. Um, and server side, we can't have it um, because otherwise applications would need to explicitly register with each and every push provider server instance their users are using. Um, if we want to support self-hosted infrastructure, right, this, this doesn't really scale. So that's why the unified push standard doesn't consider any kind of authentication on that side either. Um, that might not necessarily be a problem, but it makes banning bad actors, of course, a bit harder. Um, and if you put those two things together, you basically have infrastructure that allows uh, anyone to store small amounts of arbitrary data for a short period of time. Um, given that we had some trouble with pastebin services being abused for storing references to illegal content, right, that could be a problem. Um, at this point, I think it's mainly a theoretical problem. Uh, as long as the pastebin services are out there, they are much easier to use for this. Um, so you would need to put quite some effort into 
building a wrapper around this to, to actually abuse it for this. Um, none of this is, I think, really a hard blocker, but all of this needs careful consideration and, and monitoring. Um, so this is probably something where all the communities interested in hosting that kind of infrastructure should at least exchange uh, experience and uh, uh, yeah, the experience with operating that, um, that kind of infrastructure. Um, yeah, so um, basically we have all the building blocks, right? We, we have something that allows us to do push notifications in, a, in like the, the proper way. So completely free, supporting uh, self-hosted uh, infrastructure where, where available and giving full transparency and control to, to our users, uh, which is great. Um, there is still a few details to sort out. Nothing major, but s something that could get messy in a, like a real world hybrid uh, cross desktop scenario, right? So we should do that probably before we start rolling this out at, at scale. Uh, and yeah, as I said, my, my main hope for this event is to get in touch with people interested on um, sorting out the remaining bits. Yeah, thank you. Uh, right, that, as I said, that, was, that URL was handcrafted for, for the demo. Usually you would have a URL that contains a UUID. So that's 128 bytes of random data, right? So this is basically unguessable. Um, and in terms of how this would look like from the application, um, uh, Say NeoChat is uh, taking an example where we have this implemented, right? NeoChat tells the uh, unified push distributors, I want push notifications. And then that does the registration with the server side and it gives you a URL with that UUID. And that the application then gives that to its server side and then the server sends something there, right? So this is, <laughs> it's for one never published anywhere and it's, even if you were to try to brute force it, uh, I think it's like right, UUIDs are sufficiently random and rare that uh, this this shouldn't happen. But yes, if if you know the URL, of course you can spam people. Web push, right? Um, I know that the unified push team is um, working on aligning with web push, at least in the, on the server side API, um, to make it as easy as possible for existing libraries on the application server side to, to work with both. Um, I'm not too deeply involved in all the, uh, especially on the server side part of the specification. Um, I basically only did the, the client side part for this. Um, so the, the unified push team is probably better uh, uh, place to, to answer that in, in detail. Uh, I know though that they are trying to align this uh, as much as possible. Um, right, the, I don't think Unified Push has that at this point. I, I've seen discussions from the people working on that 
in, in that direction. Um, I think unified push is still young enough and flexible enough to, to quickly evolve in, in that direction. Um, so it's quite possible we'll, we'll get something like that. At this point, that doesn't exist yet. Um, however, that, that would probably be something that would be entirely implemented within the, uh, the, the library layer, right? So for the app, from the application point of view, uh, as little as possible should, uh, should change with that, yeah. Um, but in general, I think that is a, a useful direction to, to develop this into, yeah. So I have a question like for the team for the security prevention team. You said like the staff job is not implemented. Would you collaborate like with the security team? But the question is maybe the yeah. framework also from the default option used to be disabled and was like quite like long time and like say like by default needs to transition and if uh, you don't want to execute this way then like you would right. um so the, the suggestion here is to have also a, um, a default implementation for payload encryption as part of the, the, the library and all the other components. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree that that makes total sense. Um, that has been uh, discussed also with the uh, unified uh, push people already, uh, probably following similar mechanisms that uh, that have been proposed for, for web push. Um, it's an RFC starting with eight. Uh, I, I don't remember the details. So there is an official standard uh, from the use by web push as well that is suggested to, to be the default encryption mechanism uh, in, in this scenario. So uh, we don't have that at this point though. Uh, Right, um, right. So the 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 comment was that uh, if there isn't a good default from the start, people might get creative and don't provide the best possible outcome. Um, that is certainly a, a valid concern. Um, in practice, however, the the most likely initial users of those are uh, matrix, where there is an existing standard. One without encryption, but it, I mean, it's part of the, the matrix standard, right? So this isn't something we can influence. We have to follow whatever matrix does there. Uh, and the other one is Mastodon and the, the whole um, activity pub world. Uh, and there again, there is an existing standard for this um, or a specification, right? That where we attach to, right? Where we, we don't define how the message payloads look like. Um, but yeah, if you would develop an entirely new application around push notifications, right, then, then it makes definitely sense to have a, a good default. Sorry? Um, I mean, that's, that's the question I have here. So uh, what are the, or who on the other desktops is interested in that subject and um, can we work on, uh, on that together? Unified push on the DBoss based platforms, I think so far doesn't have any uh, production deployments. Um, we are trying to change that obviously because we want that feature, right? But rolling that out on our own without collaboration uh, would likely cause mess down the road. So that's the stage we are in. Um, on the uh, Google free Android infrastructure uh, platforms, um, it is much more widely adopted already, right? So um, I'm, I'm hoping for, for more buy-in, that's why I'm here, right? So yeah.
Um, okay, so the question is, um, are there any methods to hide uh, secondary information or metadata for push messages towards the push infrastructure, right? Um, I'm not aware of that being considered in, in the unified push specification uh, at this point. Um, it's probably also very hard to do that on the level of uh, the push notification infrastructure, right? Timing related stuff, I mean, this is all time sensitive. So delaying for random times is potentially problematic. Um, message sizes, again, is something that the application would need to do. Um, and I mean, there, there is an upper limit of four kilobyte for, for the message size. So there is, there's also limits on, on what we can do there anyway. Um, but I'm at, at this point, I'm not aware of any, uh, uh, any systematic work on, on that subject. Um, so, you mean the uh, the stability of the of the implementation or of the yeah, specification? Uh, right. I, yeah. Okay. So the the specification, the debug specification of Unified Push, uh, I think, is fairly stable. In the time I'm involved in this, I've seen like one change, and that was basically a bug fix we found as an inconsistency in the in the specification. Um, so that the, the only possible changes I can see there is as a result of the discussion I had mentioned, right? There's a few details that might need to be adjusted in order to, to solve the interoperability problems. Otherwise, I, I think it's, it's fairly stable. It's also very simple, right? It's register, unregister, here's the message, right? So there's, there's very little room for getting creative in there. And the, the implementation as such, I would also say is more or less stable, right? There, again, there, there isn't a whole lot of complexity in there. Um, I mean, implementing this takes a few days, right? And then you, you have it, right? There, there is, it's of course a bit of uh, testing with all kinds of network goes out and do we properly reconnect? And so that is a bit, bit of work. Um, but overall, the, the whole thing is, is fairly simple. 